You finally found the others. You were so sure of it. They believed what you believed, got outraged by what outraged you, and had the same ascetic tastes as you, not to mention the same enemies. It felt nourishing, therapeutic, even tribal. But these emotions are fleeting. Boredom creeps in as belonging fades. Genuinely questioning the contours of your tribe's meme space will get you in trouble. You'll be labeled as foolish, a concerned troll, or worse, a traitor. You soon learn there's no room for dissent, and you begin to intimately understand the boundaries of your tribe. You find yourself pushed to the margins. From there, you see the edges of mimetic foreign lands. Other exiles stand at those edges, questioning their tribe's main space. The content of their questions are quite different, but you sense the spirit of their questioning is the same. So maybe a good place for us to start is, I, I can't remember how, <laughs> you with skepticism, me with stoicism, felt like we didn't really belong. That sort of realizing, because you don't realize, that's the funny thing about being in a mimetic tribe. The memes become part of you. You don't, you're not like, oh, I'm doing a meme now. <laughs> It just is who you are. So you don't notice them. But because I was recording this podcast with my friend where we would go out and encounter all sorts of completely different tribes. So we, we hung out with Thelemites, who are the people who follow Alistair Crowley's religion. We, you know, we went and hung out with people who believed in Reiki, me a skeptic and her not so much of a skeptic, sort of going and having these experiences. And sort of throwing yourself in at the deep end of all these different scenarios and then coming back around to who you think of as your people. And it's, I guess it's kind of like when you go away from your own country for a while and come back, suddenly you notice the things that seemed normal before, but you start noticing patterns and you start looking at it from that slightly removed perspective, realizing how much of, of who you are has been shaped by that cultural context. At that point, it sort of clicked that I had tidied myself up so that I fit into a certain role or whatever. And I wasn't sure I wanted to do that anymore. <laughs> you found your tribe because you were a seeker, because you cared about the truth. And for a while, your truth hunger was satiated. You felt like you had finally arrived, but now things are different. You feel alienated. You realize there's no room for exploration within your tribe. And exploration is what you need. The cracks are showing, and you cannot ignore them any longer. Enough is enough. The mystery calls, and you begin to descend. You know there are others out there. You saw them at the edge, and heard murmurs of their questioning, which seems so familiar to your own. The certainty you once had is now gone, along with the memes that helped you feel at home. Uncertainty is overcoming you. You see the darkness ahead. just popping out of seeming to me popping out of nowhere yeah very strange i mean you cannot like that is the that's the kind of whatever you want to call it the pre-cosmogonic chaos the art comes out of. traditionally you enter the dark forest at the place where it seems darkest to you and the first step you have to do alone and you don't know what's going to be out there i did have an existential crisis and a mini breakdown uh because i couldn't orient myself uh, just investigating all these different tribes. And so, yeah, when I was going into them, I'm not just trying to understand them in the propositional realm, but like feel what they probably would feel if they believe what they believe to be true, it just led to a, a breakdown. And the person that saved me was Robert Anton Wilson. And it just helped ground me just knowing that you can be what he calls a mystical agnostic, that you can be in that state and not lose one shit. Like just knowing that's possible yeah. grounded me. But just having the capacity to get into that state of like agnosticism about everything, not just about God, but about kind of all your uh, truths, that is highly helpful in order to view other mimetic tribes or, or just anyone's worldview really from a non judgmental place, because you can kind of like go in their worldview with them for that time being. Uh, and having that kind of like performative agnostic space 
like as as kind of like an anchor allows you to engage with other people yeah because otherwise you have this barrier i mean there's this is the experience that i'm having when i'm going to like a witchcraft class when you're kind of acting in a journalistic role amongst a group of people who believe i don't want to misrepresent myself um but also i don't want to ruin their evening and be the skeptic in the room so that kind of forced me into looking for the part of myself that was agnostic and you're just finding like a way in to sort not necessarily see it from their perspective because I don't, don't think that's possible but to not see it so much through the lens of the tribe that I was coming from and then then it's just sort of started to happen naturally and I would be around people who I did agree with and I found myself taking the agnostic position there basically just allow me to think thoughts that I hadn't thought before like it's almost like three ontological domains one is like my basis my operating system if you will which is not strictly stoicism it's like a modified stoicism then the other domain is this this agnostic state that i can get into and then maybe the third domain is someone else's reality tunnel and in order to engage in their reality tunnel i have to be in the the middle domain and a good way to look at it too is the software language they have like a i think a live environment versus a sandbox environment that middle space is a sandbox environment because so then you can kind mm -hmm. of tinker with your own operating system by engaging in someone else's yes. in such a way it doesn't like fuck things up it's like a safe way to sandbox uh, ideas in different ways of being and knowing i've been kind of thinking of it like a corner of your garden that you leave to just do whatever it does because it's good for wildlife and it's interesting if you just leave it be and give it space without coming in with your pruning shears of skepticism and taking everything off. Interesting stuff crops up there. And then you can see if you want to incorporate it into your life, which is like a real change from my previous mission, which was kind of to tidy everything up in my head. You have fully descended into a dark forest, surrounded by the unknown. A great doubt has seeped in. Will I always feel this lost? Will I always feel this crazy? Will I always feel this alone? You realize you were sleepwalking through life before this, and more tragically, you were not really seeing people as the mystery that they are. You were filtering them through the lens of your retired truths. Another approaches, the person you saw at the edge. You feel their fear. You also feel their sense of aliveness. Finding the others, maybe this is what a great doubt was really for. Uh, and I, I kind of like, it was, I was haunted with this thought, like, I don't know how to live my fucking life. That, I mean, that resonates deeply. Uh. The third part is fully being in the forest, experiencing that great doubt and all the um, anxiety that comes along with it. Like being in wrong relationship with unknowingness, in a, mm. if you will. And then the fourth one is uh, uh, finding the chapel, experiencing the glimpses of being in right relationship with unknowingness and finding the others, not in sort of the mimetic tribal way. I like to kind of refer to the mimetic tribes in a disembodied way of relating almost um, a collective narcissism because like, oh, I, I, I know the truth, I'm right, and it makes you feel superior, then you can dunk on people who you disagree with. Um, but it's not like really connecting and relating. Refugees, if you will, of nomadic tribes are finding uh, their way to the Stoa and we're relating not via propositions, not via the memes that we share, we're relating in a more embodied way. And we're all experiencing this, this or we have experienced a sense of great doubt and unknowingness. It's, it's a very strange experience because it's not it's not like we all agree mm -hmm. it's not like oh good i must be right everyone agrees with me here it's i guess we agree on a way of being or we agree on trying to figure out a way of being even though maybe we don't agree about anything else yeah you know we're not as um intellectually confident as we'd like to be and that's okay and sort of stumbling towards a methodology where we can talk together about what matters most and trying to bridge these gaps between our minds. It's a really like delicious place to be, relating in a way that, you know, is beyond just finding the truth. In the last session of Chapel Perilous, I played this crazy game with people. I called the Wheel of Certainties, um, where I made one of those um, like Wheel of Fortune spinners. And I had all these difficult topics on it, you know, sex, religion, politics, stuff that people always express a lot of certainty about. And I invited someone to come up and spin the wheel. And then 
whatever it landed on, they had to shrug, they had to smile and then say, I don't know, and fill in the blank, something about that topic. Amazing. And every single person, when they said that, I don't know, I was like, I don't know that either. And it just felt like the relief to be like, oh, we are all just faking. <laughs> like right, to some right. degree, when we're presenting ourselves on the internet as people who know everything about these difficult topics, which are complicated and probably take at least one lifetime to figure out just for yourself, let alone to say anything about anyone else, that's not real. I mean, maybe some people are, I don't know, but a lot of people are not as certain as they present themselves to be. And mm. realizing that makes you feel not crazy, not alone. <laughs> and like it, like it, it just opens up potential for having conversations that weren't there before. Your new friend is different in many ways. They tell you about the mimetic tribe they were once memeing with. It is different from yours. You do not fully get it, but you are surprised by how cool you are with not getting it. You notice that you do not have a sense of judgment towards them like you would have had before. You notice that they are not judging you as well. Something else is similar. They are going through a great doubt too, experiencing the same confusion, fear, and aliveness that you are experiencing. A purple light appears, and you see a neon sign flickering. The sign reads, Chapel Perilous, and the purple light starts to reveal the contours of a structure, one that does not seem to belong to this time. It does not seem to belong to time at all. You move towards to get a closer look, and when you do, your sense of fear starts to dissipate. The confusion you felt is still here, but you no longer view it as a negative thing. The desire to celebrate the confusion starts to bubble up. Others emerge from the dark forest, exiles from other mimetic tribes. You already feel more understood by how this emerging embodied tribe does not understand you. It's not every day I wear my sexy turtleneck, so it's like, you know, really happy to... <laughs> you faced it. You brought up the term, a chapel perilous. It might be good to chat about your discovery of that and, you know, what, what that term even means. So I came across it in that Robert Anton Wilson book, Cosmic Trigger, and it was just a really cool term. In the book, he tries on lots of different conspiracy theories intellectually and really tries to believe them when he's experimenting with them. And after a while, as kind of happened to us he goes a bit loopy like there's too much stuff going on and he's not sure what's real and what's the conspiracy theory and what he's sort of programmed himself to think because he's experimenting with these ideas and what's his his real ideas and what's reality and what's fiction basically and he calls that state chapel perilous it's actually a really old word it dates back to um to Arthurian texts. And in those stories, it's a place that when the hero's on his grail quest, he goes down into this spooky, scary forest, comes across this abandoned chapel, and he goes into shelter. And depending on which, which book you read, because it turns up multiple times, different things happen. One of my favorite ones is like this spectral hand that comes in and like snuffs out each of the candles one by one, and then like comes through his throat. Basically a place where you face your mortality on the way to get the grail. The grail symbolizing, well, who knows what. But when I was reading it, because of the context in which I was reading it, I was thinking perhaps the grail represents that kind of like, oh, meta certainty. Like everything is sorted. I have the grail now, I know what's going on. And maybe that, that moment in the chapel facing your mortality is something like seeing your quest for the fruitless thing that it will be. Because I mean, I personally don't think that that sort of meta certainty is possible. Yeah, and then the other place it pops up is in one of my favorite poems, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. It's like this post-apocalyptic poem. London is just ravaged by the war. All the old certainties are falling apart. And I mean, the way Eliot puts it together is just like fragments. It's very sort of bricolage. And it, it makes you feel disoriented reading this poem. And then there's the chapel there. And he sees it as um, it's empty now. Like there's no monsters, there's no nothing there. Just all the meaning is gone and it's not a threat anymore. And I wonder whether that's because he couldn't imagine anyone going on a grail quest anymore. Like the idea of searching for what they used to search for is just not, not possible for him. But collectively, we're losing our shit. Everyone is experiencing this thing right now. There's this state, this doubt sensation, uncertainty, unknowingness. And 
instead of trying to double down into a, a worldview to a mimetic tribe, let's lean into this, this yeah. uncertainty because I think this is what we need. And, it, and, it's, and it's scary. I mean, it invokes all these emotions, anxiety, and all that type of stuff. But you know, we can get into right relationship with it. And there's that, that quote, a great doubt, great awakening, uh, a little doubt, little awakening, no doubt, no awakening. Uh, and so it's like, it's, it's part of one's spiritual or philosophical journey to go through this. It's a rite of passage, if you will. I also have a desire to give a disclaimer. I've, I've um, as I mentioned, I've, I've had a, quite a few existential crises in my life. And, you know, I, I was untethered from reality a couple of times. And it's not pretty being in that state. It's quite dangerous. Luckily, I had a really great uh, relationships kind of like keeping the truth on me, keeping me in check. Uh, so this is something that this one should not just jump into. You know, like just you need it with drum vehicles, a college of practices to mm. kind of like keep one grounded so they can experience this great doubt in such a way that they can see or experience what's beyond it in an embodied way. Be prepared, take care, look after yourself. But at some point you just have to experiment and see what happens. And I think if people are feeling that this is the right time for them to start pushing some boundaries, perhaps we'll do it with you gently. You stay with the paradox, you embrace the mystery, you enter the chapel.